All right, all right. Hello, Facebook, and welcome back to another master class with the Back to School series at the Percussion Conservatory. My name is Joshua Vonderheide, and I am the founder of the Percussion Conservatory, which is a platform just for classical percussionists who are interested in sharing and growing and learning and potentially pursuing a classical percussion career. I am joined today by Marcelina Sahotska and Stephen Keener, who will be hosting today's class. And I am going to drop out and do the video sharing for today. And Stephen, you can take us away. Thanks, for every thanks everybody, for being here. Yeah, so thanks to our audience here in the webinar and also on Facebook. A um, couple of just um, quick housekeeping things for those of you who are, those of you who are in the webinar. Uh, we have a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. You can use that um, to put in your questions for Marcelina live, and we will answer them either in the flow of the class or at the Q&A session at the end. Um, you can also use the chat um, if you have any comments or, or other things to share. Um, you can raise your hand as well um, to ask a question. Um, so please keep all of that in mind. And then today, uh, we are super, super excited to welcome Marcelina. Uh, Marcelina Suchotska as a fellow at the New World Symphony, um, originally hailing from Poland, um, and she's played with tons and tons of orchestras around the world um, and has had a very, uh, a vari a, her, her career has a lot of variety, uh, playing chamber music um, as well. So we're really happy to have you here, Marcelina, and uh, looking forward to seeing uh, what you have to share uh, about the orchestral uh, orchestral glockenspiel, sorry. So take it away. Thanks everybody, hello. As, my, as Steven just said, my name is Marcelina Suchotska and I'm a percussionist at the New World Symphony. I'm super excited to be presenting to you this class on the glockenspiel or the orchestral bells. So this instrument is, I feel like very, unique in its own way. Uh, it's, not, it's not really in the realm of a marimba, not quite in the realm of a vibraphone, obviously. Um, most of them don't have an instrument. Ms. Adams technically does have a pedal, but it's more used for cutting off the sound. So the bells are in their own realm, and I feel like they can be overlooked, and it can really be something that adds to your audition or can detract from it. So I'll don't worry, I'll give you some tips on how to perform this instrument really, really well. So first, let's just look at the construction of this instrument. I'll get to some playing in a second, but let's just uh, look over some basic things about it. So the bells are a small instrument. It's not gigantic like our chimes, although they are similar in the sense that they, we you know, strike them with a mallet and they can ring for a long time. Um, it is a small instrument. This should also give us some ideas on perhaps how we might approach it, how we might play it. So there's also another thing about it is that sometimes they have a frame like this or they might be inside of a box. Um, you've probably seen either one. I've seen professional orchestras have both. Usually they're taken out like this and they have the resonators exposed, but sometimes they don't. And that should also set off alarms in your head in the way that, okay, I'm gonna have to maybe change my touch a little bit. And we'll talk about touch sensitivity as well. So it's a small instrument that might point us in the idea that we might need some smaller motions. Maybe we don't need to move so big. Um, of course, there are exceptions to all of this. Um, please don't take anything I say as a doctrine that it's always this way, it's my way or the highway. That's absolutely not what I want you to walk away with. It's really important to take some of these concepts and just chew on them and figure out ways that you can use it and explore even more. So it's a small instrument, and what else about it? Hmm, it can be overpowered. We can easily overpower this instrument. We can overplay it. Absolutely, we can. Um, it's also high-pitched. It's a very high-pitched instrument. If you've ever played uh, the bells for someone who perhaps 
uh, you know, doesn't regularly hear them. Maybe it's like your parents or, you know, I don't know, maybe a violinist who just hasn't heard them up close. You'll automatically, I guarantee you get this. You're going to get this. It's not maybe so much that you're playing loud. Um, I mean, hopefully you're not like whacking at the top of the range in front of them. But oftentimes, and I've been, I remember I used to be really surprised people would walk in the room and they're like, ah, because not, not necessarily my volume, but sometimes just the high frequencies. You know, I've been playing percussion so long. Maybe that part of my ear is just totally gone. <laughs> and I just can't hear them anymore or something. But there's definitely still some of that when I'm maybe I've taken a break from playing the glockenspiel for a while and then suddenly I play it and I'm like, oh, there's all these weird frequencies I'm hearing. So that's something we need to think about. This can be an issue in auditions. Perhaps you're playing, um, let's say, on stage or in a smaller hall and there is a dividing um, screen and the panel's right behind, or you don't even know if they're right behind, but generally, if it's like on stage and there's a screen, they're not too far away. I mean, hopefully the stage is not like, I don't know, an NFL field. So they're probably really, really close. That's something we also need to consider. So I feel like I'm posing more questions right now than answers, but don't worry, we'll get there. <laughs> so. And another thing, and probably the most important thing about the glockenspiel, is that it's a ringing instrument. Let me say that again. The glockenspiel is a ringing instrument, a ringing metal instrument. And so I know it sounds really obvious, and it's like, okay, yeah, well, duh, it's metal, and it's like, it rings. Um, but you almost have to like not take that for granted because that if you think about it, you know, as a ringing metal instrument, like what, is she, what does she mean by that? Well, do the notes automatically connect themselves? Does that mean that the ear might get confused by some of the sounds? These, are, these things are all true. All of what I was just talking about, using small motions, the fact that it can be overpowered, the fact that it's high pitched, all that has to do with the construction and with the fact that it's a ringing metal instrument. Similar to its cousin, the triangle. This is not a triangle class, but the triangle. We can really almost see this instrument as just a series of tiny triangles. Um, one major thing for me is about the technique on the glockenspiel is do not play this like a marimba. I love the marimba. Um, I play the marimba a lot, but this is not a marimba. Um, obviously, it's the marimba can take so much more arm weight. You can really play into it. I mean, if you see some of these incredible marimba players, they're just you know like using huge motions. If you do that on the glockenspiel, it won't it won't generate great results. And so you hopefully would not play the triangle like this. Same thing, you do not want to play the glockenspiel this way. You want to play the glockenspiel in a similar manner touch that you play the triangle. Of course, we play the triangle a hundred different ways, as you should. You know, as if you have a big Mahler role in the symphony, obviously that's going to require some arm weight. But let's say you're playing just a little, you know, tiny part in opera. Maybe you don't need so much motion. So I just want to maybe frame that and frame this instrument in a way that think about it more towards the triangle realm and even a little bit of the timpani realm. I know that sounds crazy, but a little bit more like the timpani realm than this. It's nothing, nothing like this. I mean, I don't want to say nothing. Of course, there's ways we can relate these instruments to each other, and I don't want you to walk away with like, okay, I have to just like completely change my technique. I can't, um, you know, I, I need to completely just change everything. That's absolutely not what I'm saying. So let me just do some playing so I don't just yammer the whole time.
Um, this is just a little Irish tune called Captain White. Let me, let me make sure everything's working okay. Yeah, this is called Captain White. It's like a little Irish tune. Um, I feel like I learned a lot about the glockenspiel just playing these little like funny melodies. I mean, you could probably sight read a lot of music on the glockenspiel. We'll talk about that more. But um, yeah, this is one little demonstration. So looking at how I just approach this instrument right now, you didn't see me, you know, using ginormous motions. Hopefully you didn't see me um, doing any unnecessary motion. Of course, we want to be expressive when we play. Absolutely. Um, most people, when they see me play, I'm not like a robot, completely expressionless. Of course. I'm just saying that within the bells, there's just a um, tendency to just take everything, just make it a little bit smaller. So also so we were talking about maybe the box sound right now i don't have a box instrument but what would you do if you were given a box glock so a glockenspiel in a box how do we avoid making it sound like that of course there's limitations of course maybe if you have just like you know just a really not unfortunate instrument you know there's only so much you can do but there are some you know, techniques I can give you if you are in a situation, maybe you're auditioning in a more local band or whatever, and they might have a box glock. So number one is a brighter stick. Um, think if you use like, just like a giant ball mallet, it's not gonna help the sound come out of there. So maybe like a smaller, smaller little ball like that, or, uh, We'll, we'll talk about, we can talk about touch, like lifting out of the instrument even more so than you would normally and moving to smaller muscle groups. So we're going to talk a lot about physicality in my class. And so, for example, when you're playing on the, in the, with a box glock, that's something that you need to think about is playing into the instrument. You can get away with it on some of these, especially like a, an Adams. Uh, glock be like this you can actually kind of play into it sometimes but the box glocks really you really need to just like get out of there have a really nice soft touch let's backtrack a little bit <laughs> I started talking about uh, this instrument um, let's talk about technique so it's not completely different from some instruments we play like I mentioned the triangle um, even so the chimes but let's talk about it relating to the timpani. Um, you might be looking at me like I'm crazy. Like, what, what does this instrument have to do with the timpani? It's like a mallet instrument that's a drum. What are you talking about? But I think we do really have something to learn from some timpanists. So if you see like, some of these amazing timp timpanists, I mean, we have seen on the Prussian Conservatory, Eric Ripple, uh, he demonstrated a bunch of timpani excerpts one by one. And you can just see from his playing, some of these elements I'm talking about can totally be applied to the glockenspiel. Um, you don't see, you know, excellent timpanists maybe in America, obviously, if I'm talking about America, I know Europe is a whole another world, but you don't see them laying into the drum, leaving it in there, obviously. Um, but you don't also see maybe um, this touch sensitive like you you really see way more touch sensitivity so what does that mean touch sensitivity being sensitive to the touch i know that sounds hilarious but you really need to be more sensitive to some of these instruments when you're playing the timpani you want the instrument to ring 
right? So, nece so maybe necessarily you don't want to lay into the drum too long. Um, my teacher used to talk about uh, three parts of the stroke. There's the initial approach to the instrument, then the point of contact and how long, the type of interaction. What is this interaction like? Once you've made contact, is it a long interaction? Is it a harsh interaction? Is it a bright interaction? And then the follow through. So all of these things have to do with our approach to the glockenspiel. And I make this kind of analogy with the timpani um, because it really helped me th think about um, glockenspiel playing while thinking about it almost like a timpani. And in particular, um, a lot of timpanists uh, using this J stroke idea. Um, and this technique is very much so almost like you're, if you write, you're, if you're writing a J in the American alphabet, like a J, you use almost like an oval, circular type stroke. And thinking about that and applying it to the glockenspiel really helped me develop this sense of touch. Obviously, when you need to brighten it up compared to the timpani, obviously you can't really play into it as much like that. But just practice playing a little bit of this J stroke almost on the glockenspiel. It's a little simple way of describing it, but like this idea of using a little bit of this natural arm weight that we have I mean, we can't do anything about it. I mean, I guess you could kind of play like this, but naturally we have this forearm weight, arm weight. And also be careful not to, like I was warning about, leave it in the instrument. I do not mean this. Because really what, what you're doing when you, when you do this, you really are essentially just playing into the instrument and then all this lift it's all artificial once you've done once you've done this and you lift artificially that this is just like cosmetic this doesn't do anything so letting the stick drop naturally of course and then letting it come back up naturally and now also practice this in the variety of dynamics soft loud Practice this in all kinds of dynamics, and then also practice your other hand, especially your weak hand. Your weak hand will have a harder time maybe grasping this concept. And eventually, you want to maybe back out from playing, you know, angles, because eventually you're going to have to play some lines, and maybe you don't want to be playing with this motion, because you're going to be all over the keyboard. Speaking of that, when we're playing, well, really any mallet instrument, but right now we're talking about the glockenspiel, we have to think about horizon this horizontal sense of horizontal and vertical motion. What do I mean by that? When we're playing, you know, excerpts, especially things like, um, you know, the waterfall passage in the Sources of Apprentice, that fast passage, also the uh, work up, uh, Prokofiev's Piano Concerto, it's being asked more and more on auditions. I mean, you're really all over the instrument. So, I mean, practicing scales, especially chromatic scales, um, practice all your different scales on this thing. If, especially if you've just never done it, if this instrument's a little bit more alien to you, and a lot of these concepts are a little bit more new to you, try introducing it, not with immediately jumping into the excerpt, but some little, like, etudes like I was just demonstrating, or scales and arpeggios. So that way you can get used to this horizontal aspect of the instrument and also the vertical aspect. The vertical aspect I was just talking about, this touch sensitivity, using your fingers, your wrists, and then your arm for certain aspects of it. And so how do we use arm without it getting like I was saying, heavy and just not, not the right touch. Well, we use the arm not so much to lay into the instrument, but also to connect the notes. But, but the glockenspiel just naturally connects the notes for me. 
Mm-mm, no, I don't think so. <laughs> so what do I mean? Let's say, uh, maybe I can demonstrate with Sleeping Beauty. If I'm to play it, let's say, without connecting it, and kind of just like an average way of playing it. fine like you know I don't think it really did anything you know I don't like I didn't make any bad sounds I was lifting out of the instrument but I was missing some of this arm arm weight and use of arm and maybe I can now demonstrate it better so than I can maybe say it I'm still following through with my wrist. My wrist is still coming up after each interaction. However, the interactions were slightly longer. At the point of contact, my interactions were a little bit longer and I was using my arm to connect the notes instead of pa 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 thinking each note as da 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 as its individual occurrence. It was more so about feeling, you know, the waltz. The beat one is more important maybe than beat two. Beat three is also important, but not as important as beat one. All this is way more communicated in the music when you install the use of some forearm connections. And one way of thinking about it this way is the aspect of continuous motion. This is so important in all kinds of playing you do. I mean, one way to kind of describe it is by saying molar. I mean, you can also, you can say definitely molar is one way of saying, of course, like we're using all these body parts, but I think saying continuous motion definitely helps you in your head think about, okay, if I stop the motion, I'm just working twice as hard. And this even relates to something else. I feel like this all of this is, you know, spiraling in my head, but this also relates to doubles. I mean, when you play double like you're going to max out eventually. You won't be able to do that that fast. But if you do this continuous motion, you can do that all day. You won't get tired. S same thing if you're playing tambourine, if you're using continuous motion to play things, or even cymbals, you will be able to, you know, just do it way more efficiently. I feel like that's another word is efficiency. You really want to start doing things efficiently on the glockenspiel. Okay, I feel like I've talked enough. Let's play some videos. So let's start with the first one, please, if we can cue that up. I'll be past me will be demonstrating some playing. Sorry guys, just one moment. I'm queuing it up right now.
Okay, so that was La Mer. As you know, Claude Debussy's La Mer. Um, so when we think about this music, it's this French, you know, ethereal kind of like, I mean, the piece is called ocean, you know, the ocean, the water, the sea. So definitely we get these vibes of like, oh, it's just like floating, it's just kind of existing. And that's very similar to the touch that you want. Also true at the same time, you don't want maybe necessarily your time to be as fluid as the water for this excerpt. Because, I mean, there's still, you know, rhythms written in, there's still dynamics written in, there's slur markings written in. Those all need to exist while we create this ambiance of the sea. So how do we do that? Um, <laughs> I think that, you know, the way I, especially as initially practice this after like maybe not practicing it for a while or for an audition or something, unfortunately is some very rigid metronomic practice. Just to start off with, um, just so you have a baseline. So for example, I'll have the metronome on the, 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 like every single subdivision just to get, especially at the beginning, if you're not so familiar with this, or even if you are, um, having the metronome on, and then another thing is uh, saying it, definitely saying it with the metronome, because this thing is ringing. I mean, if you have a pedal, that'd be great, because then you can uh, muffle the instrument and really hear your rhythms. And this figure, this figure, uh, <laughs> I feel like it can pose trouble to some. And one way to just, you know, knock out that fear basically is fill in the missing or the tied note. Or I've also seen like kind of um, air striking with a missing note. Just so, just so you hear, I'm, I'm saying like, don't actually end up doing it, but just so you can really hear that relationship between the 16th notes and the six tuplets, triplets. Um, and so when I'm playing this, when I'm using my metronome, I'll be singing it. So in my head, I'm almost uh, like previewing in my head the next subdivision I need to achieve. So before I play the I'm not maybe so much thinking that I'm already thinking Next, the figure at 18, you know, poses a, poses a, you know, trouble. So obviously there's a couple of ways we can work on it is playing the sex tuplets. One way to, in my opinion, to kind of clear up the sound, because when, when you hear in a hall, when you hear in a mock audition, when you hear like some, sometimes people playing it, it just kind of sounds like and in, in order to kind of clear this up is having this reactionary, very light touch and not being like, okay, it's four time. I'm gonna just lay into this thing. It's not gonna produce maybe the result that you want. Another thing uh, I tend to do, you don't have to do this at all, but is putting a little button, not an accent, not a tenuto, put a little button in your touch on the second part of it. Because the tendency is that it runs. So if you go, just a tiny bit, I'm really cautioning you, do not accent it. But if you just put a little button on it, it will just, I promise you, it will be a little bit more recognizable to the panel. Um, after we do this super, you know, serious metronomic practice, then I move into singing it in my head in a longer, like in a more tenuto way. So instead of I sing it 
more long so then you don't make these jagged motions and i guess i can talk about the opening too i feel like the opening also poses a problem for some because we're just like okay you go up to the thing and you're supposed to play you know these piano octaves this thing is so hot that high c so you're like okay like what am i to do and then we do a lot of this nervous stuff like this before we start playing i would like to caution you against this if you find yourself like you know doing like a whole like nba warm-up before you play this tiny instrument with these tiny sticks i don't think it's going to help you so just practice just lowering your arms onto the glockenspiel and just practice it's i mean it's the same thing as when we practiced closing our symbols as soft as we can why don't we do the same thing for glockenspiel? And then I really rely on my arms for the opening. Okay, so there's a bunch of talking on that. Let's roll the next clip. I think it's Magic Flute. That is right. Magic Flute is next. Okay, um, so I'll just talk quickly through this one. Um, a lot of people use these tiny mallets for this. You absolutely don't need to. My teacher used to call these uh, pea shooters. Don't need to do that. <laughs> so tiny, yes, I know, tiny mallets. Um, the reason why people use them is so that, you know, you can kind of fit within the dynamic of the excerpt. I mean, really, I'm sure when, you eventually play this in the opera, which is like maybe once in a lifetime to zero times, because it's usually the actual instrument used for this. Um, you probably would play it much louder, but that goes with everything we play, you know? <laughs> uh, I, we just covered La Mer. You probably play that like a solid mezzo piano in the orchestra, just because there's so much going on. And if you just go up to the instrument and like whisper, no one's gonna, no one's gonna hear that. But that goes with everything. So you don't have, absolutely don't have to use small mallets, but that's kind of like the trend, I guess. More importantly, um, Mozart. This is, a, this is an excerpt on your audition that you can really either win some points or people are kind of like, I mean, that occurred, you know, that happened. So how can we wow someone with Mozart? It's Mozart. But to me, it's like, it's Mozart. This is the one thing that, you know, or one of the few things that, you know, the string players on the committee, the wind players are like, okay, I know this. So that, that's so much more reason for you to be like, okay, I'm gonna really make some informed decisions about how to interpret this. Um, we can use things like the harmony. It's so important uh, when I hear, you know, string players, the play the Mozart violin, the fifth violin concerto, I think is often asked, they often talk to me like, oh, can you really hear this harmony? Can, can you hear that I'm going to this cadence and all this stuff? Same thing. Um, and then we also wanna talk about the big beats. So we have, you know, one measure. Beat one is very important. We don't want to accent it, but we, I'm just saying that it's important. So that 
definitely influences my very first notes. I don't go up to the instrument and go. Doesn't make sense, obviously. You want to go into the downbeat in general. You don't need to crescendo too much, but we want to have an emphasis to not confuse the listener's ear. When we do these, it's almost like two voices. We want to think about it as two individual voices. Hey, Marcelina, I hate to interrupt you. I'm so sorry, but would you mind just quickly in your audio settings changing that suppression back to low? Because for some reason, all of a sudden, our Zoom webinar does not like <laughs> your glockenspiel tiny mallets. I don't know why that happened, but it's just, it's cutting you out for some reason. I put it on low. Let's see if that- uh, I think that's already better. It sounds great. I'm gonna put you, I'm gonna put you back on the spotlight. All right. Thank you so much. No, I know, it's always a struggle with percussion on Zoom. <laughs> so, um, we're talking about the two different voices. Ba, ba, ba. This is the one that's kind of highlighting, highlighting where we are in the chordal structure. And this one is almost like accessorizing it. It's like the little smiley face. So that being said, we take so much care with these Let's take care with these. Let's finish that stroke. Um, these. Dun, dun, dun. Do we want to slam them? Maybe not. I don't know. <laughs> so the, the only reason why I say that is because in general, in general, of course there's exceptions and of course it is fun sometimes to make exceptions, but in general, in Mozart phrasing, we come away from the beat. Once we hit the tonic, once we play the tonic, we kind of... You just don't hear so much in Mozart, people go... I mean, of course, at the end, maybe of like a raucous symphony, that sounds great. But I think you'll earn way more points and it will sound way more mature if in, if in your phrasing, you phrase <laughs> into the cadence. Um, yeah, I think that kind of covers it. And then we can move on to the next one. Awesome. Coming right up. So Sorcerer's Apprentice, L'Apprenti Sorcière. Um, this is obviously one of the most common excerpts that is asked. Um, one thing to, it's very important to note that I've seen, of, of course, this is the main edition that's used. They like pretty much never use the other edition, but I have seen an edition that uses, um, that has an added drag sort of like ornament. And this had kind of really informed the way I interpret this thing. We have, yes, we have these, you know, flams, these uh, ornaments in this music, but by no means do we want them to overtake the main notes. Another thing that to think about when you're approaching this is sense of phrase, sense of line when we play this, and how do we do that? Um, there's different, you know, opinions out there. I've heard phrases of three or just long 
uh, four eight measure bar phrases. I tend to like the one that's in like a long three. Um, this piece that's just this piece is just so exciting. Many of us like kind of grew up on you know the Fantasia, and so really channel that when you play this. This piece is super exciting. Um, and then another thing to watch out for, kind of watch out for in this, is once we get to this really loud dynamic. Just because we're playing loud, um, this is more reason to really lift out, have a lighter touch on the instrument, especially here, because an instrument like this, you can really hear the frame, unfortunately, or, or you know, a box instrument, certainly you really will need to, uh, even though you've now reached the peak, you know, the climax, tan, ta, tan, tan, it really needs to be more of a tan, ta, tan, tan, so that you don't get some of these um, low fundamentals or God forbid you play the C so loud that the C sharp is activated, which I hear all the time. So really just lift on that last note to avoid activating that C sharp. Sorry, that was loud. <laughs> um, next thing is this waterfall passage at 22. Um, another passage that can kind of like overwhelm a panel for sure. Um, Obviously, what I've seen used a lot is either these brass or aluminum mallets, perfectly acceptable. I would maybe caution that if the panel, for example, is on stage or you're in a tiny space, because it's going to be a nightmare for the panel. I mean, it's just going to be a wall of sound. Um, and I would much rather go for clarity here than like, look how loud and fast I can play. Similarly, similarly, obviously in the recordings of this, this thing goes by so fast, that poor Glock player. Um, that's great. Um, like that's technically, you know, the way I've heard it go. I've, you know, I've actually played it here, the New World Symphony, and it was blazingly fast. However, this is one of the few exceptions. I feel like in an audition, no one's going to penalize you for just taking it a little bit slower. Uh, not because it's difficult, but just so that the people can process these notes a little bit clearer. Um, and another thing about this is once you get to 23, um, it's, it will definitely help in the clarity and consistency if you keep the emphasis on beat one. Because if it's you're going to get the seasick feeling and it's going to be really confusing to the ear. Next thing about this, one final thing about this is learn the whole excerpt. Um, you just never know. I mean, of course, people like tell, you know, they'll give you a list of like, we're going to only ask this, but just even just learning it, of course, I mean, maybe they won't ask the rest of it, but learning the rest of this piece will help inform you about the rest of the work will really just give you a better knowledge. And I would say that about every piece, but in particular this one. Uh, yeah, let's hey. roll the next one. Marcelina, a quick question here. I wanted to kind of throw it back to your intro. You were talking about, um, you know, touch and, and having control over that. And I, to me, like this is, a, this is completely on display um, at this point in your class because uh, you started with La Mer and now going to sorcerers and just it's so clear your control over arm weight and touch on the instrument just wondering if you can talk a little bit about um how you practice things like that and how you think about you know what um what stroke type and how your touch is going to be different from something like wc to to this piece here sorcerer's apprentice yeah absolutely um it really is all related um there is aspects of everything of course there's times where I really want to just have little bursts of notes. And maybe it's not so similar to the La Mer where I really just I'm trying to connect. For example, here in Sources Apprentice at 38. Um, things like that, you really just want to have uh, give off these little bell-like sounds. And this is something also just related to like 
my experience in the orchestra, conductors really want to hear the bells. Um, there's never been a time that they kind of do this for the bells. It's, I've, I've never seen it. They can't get enough and half the time they're probably are probably so deafened or maybe they're older and they just don't don't have that you know part of their hearing anymore so in general some of these bell like like you know present sounds is what they want to hear um similar so for example how, how do i approach you know the touch of these things as sources apprentice for example is the music informs me the time informs me so we were talking about the phrasing so I know I'm going to have to articulate those notes and connect those notes at the same time. So practicing this slowly certainly helps. I'm exaggerating the motions. So and this similar kind of to this j-stroke idea I was talking about I mean I'm really playing a diagonally here you don't have to do that but I mean I would spend oh my gosh like an hour just in the practice room just trying to get this G right before I even got to the next note I would just be like ah it's too soft pretty good but maybe too much fundamental too much fundamental less less and I would just judge it and then, okay, okay, I got my G and then I move on to the F. So our next note is an F. Should it be louder than the G? My opinion, no, because it's on B3. So if you go, it's going to confuse the ear and it's not helping your sense of da, 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 da. To me, it's like, there's like, you know, some golden rules that we have to kind of follow. Of course, there's exceptions to this, especially in contemporary music, but there are, of course, main beats, beat one, that are very important, and like a measure of four, uh, beat four is very important, four, one, in uh, measure time, three time, one, two, three, one, two, three, I mean, three is very important, not as important as one, but it's, it's like one, two, three, one, two, three. That doesn't mean you're dynamic. I'm not saying your dynamics have to follow that exact order, but I feel like your touch kind of does. So that definitely informs me. Um, also where I'm playing on the glockenspiel, so important. Um, when we're up here, we really don't, we don't have much room for this arm weight as much as maybe we do here. To it but if I did the same thing up here I'm already hearing this thing is struggling so within the range so I guess that's the one similarity with marimba is you have to think about your touch a little bit that way as well hopefully I answered that question yeah definitely we actually just had another question um, come in um, from somebody in the Q&A here that relates directly to this too so I'll go ahead and ask it um, just asking specifically too about um, Sorcerer's Apprentice um connecting notes with your arm and wondering how you differentiate articulations i know in that in that part there's a lot of different staccatos and slurs and things a lot happening in the ink there so wondering how you differentiate that using your touch um, for this excerpt mm -hmm. uh okay so for example we have clear accents written and we have I mean, we pretty much have a dot over every note besides the accents. So basically, he really wants this So we don't have so much time for this arm stuff, but I still use a little bit just to help with uh, consistency. Really, what I'm thinking about when I'm playing this is especially the follow through of my stroke, more so than the approach to the instrument. I'm really following through in each note, I'm fo finishing each stroke. What I see a lot is like, you, okay, you have a really pretty first note and then once you get to these 
of uh, kind of flammed, uh, accented beats, uh, people use that as an excuse to just kind of, okay, I'm done, like, making pretty sound. I'm just going to, like, you know, lay into the instrument, like, you know, play all, all these accents. Um, the accents kind of almost take care of themselves, especially if you're thinking in this um, three pattern. The accents will kind of pretty much take care of themselves. I don't, I don't think, I mean, of course, you make sure to play them, but they, you really don't need too much of the touch. If anything, we really need to finish each stroke. And here, even more lift. Connect. So playing this slow absolutely helps. And then same thing with 22. What really helps me with this thing, I mean, it can be, you know, definitely challenging, and especially at the beginning, is playing it with like almost like a singular motion. What it looks like on the page, I think I, he's like almost hinting to you what you're supposed to do. This is big old slur. I'm exaggerating, but because if you're thinking, it's it's just gonna get it's gonna be too much for your brain to process all at once. Um, hopefully that answers the question. Yeah, awesome. Uh, I want to move on, Josh, to the next uh, excerpt. I think it's Pines. Yes, that would be perfect. All right, so another one that's one of the first things that we learn when we uh, learn glockenspiel excerpts. One thing that really is important about this excerpt, um, of course, everything, everything is true all at once. I guess it's just some excerpts, some aspects of them are more important than others, right? Of course, the time is important, the phrasing is so important, but the opening of this is really kind of a test to your internal time. How good is your internal time? Can you, can you uh, really subdivide in your head? Come in after these nine measure rests. Come in after the five measure rest. And then execute this little thing. Um, there's two ways of playing it, obviously. Uh, this, this figure, or you can have your hands. I kind of always preset it to like, I like double check right before I play it. Make sure that it's a fifth. And then the way I practice this one personally is just the right hand. And 
Make sure you really lift after that. Uh, so how do we practice this internal time is I've seen people use like these metronome apps where you can make presets so you can have it set to a certain amount of measures in the two and then it'll go into the three. You can do that. Um, you can also test yourself by keeping the two while it's still while like keep the like, metronome on in two. But once it gets to uh, figure two in the three eight, then you can still keep it on, but count in three. Um, yeah, this one is I'm really singing in my head really loud. Don't lag here. Here, uh, coming in too early is always like, you know, the sin people commit. So really, it's on beat three. It is fast. So that's why maybe don't choose the quickest tempo in the world for this. So, I mean, especially in the audition, there's really no need. Uh, there's a tendency, like I was just saying, uh, to lag behind in the flammed Fs. Because you're kind of like, you know? Uh, and then as you heard me singing, once we get to the triplets, I'm really singing the triplets in my head. I've abandoned the two. And then the five, I'm already singing the ba da dum bum. And then I play ba da dum bum, ba da dum bum. As you heard me doing in La Mer, I always have my counting match with what I'm about to do. Because if you're counting in something else, it's, it's not going to help you. And then same, it's very similar uh, once we get to the Pew Vivo at the end. Dun, 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 dun. So I'm dividing like crazy. Dun, 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 dun. Don't go too fast here already because you're going to be screwed at the end. Dun, 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 dun. Look at that accent, but don't slam it. And then here you don't want to go absolutely crazy in your accelerando because it's, it's just not how the music goes. Um, so this one really is a test, and I think of your eternal time, but I really think singing it and like making conscious decisions. Okay, I know that when I get, for example, to this part, I'm gonna be no faster than that. And you try to memorize it. And then once I get to the bum, 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 I know it's gonna be no faster than that. Just try to memorize these individual ones and then practice just from one part to another. Dun, 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 dun. And just stop and just practice that over and over again. Practicing these transitions. That's, that's what's gonna really help you. <laughs> Do we have another video, or was that it? Uh, no, we have exotic birds. Was it exotic? Oh yeah, so this is just like a fun I threw on here.
<laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh, I see. Oh, Josh Jones is in the house. Hello. Oh, my brother from another mother. I miss you so much. Okay. <laughs> Hi, Josh. <laughs> I've known Josh since I was like eight years old. So it's like an older brother. Uh, anyways. Uh, yeah. So this excerpt um, sometimes asks on auditions. Uh, so much to say about this one. Uh, most importantly, it is very busy. It's very busy, especially to the ears. It's very busy physically. So you really want to not throw away all these things I was talking about. Uh, just because, you know, like, okay, now I, you can do it with four mallets. Maybe you don't want to do it with four mallets. Um, really want to make sure that this finishing stroke idea is present. And of course, with like Wazo Exotique, if you play, you know, the Zalfon part, Similarly, we have all these different articulations written. Realistically, especially like at 28, 30, can we get to all of them? Maybe not. I've, I've actually gotten to play this um, at a, a festival and I got to play the glockenspiel part. And I remember thinking like, okay, you know, I was like, you know, trying my best, you know, doing all the articulations, of course. And that's so important. Um, but once, especially when you get to 28 to 30, if you play this in the band, this thing just kind of like comes and goes. And <laughs> you really just want to bring out as much of it as you can, as well as uh, trying to create phrase and line where you can. So, for example, when we get to the 28, 30 section, I do it with four mallets. I suppose you can do it with two. Uh, here. Just one little opportunity for you to create a musical line. And then for this uh, next section, which obviously is like, I feel like the struggle bus for many of us, is keeping the, um, as George Hamilton Green said, keep the hammers low. You really need to keep your hammers low here. Um, of course, you want to You want to make sure you're doing this nice slurring and also not letting these ornaments disturb the line in any way. Of course, we want them to be heard, but the main note is the main note. So maybe try to not keep them so wide so it doesn't confuse the ear because it is already fast, especially in places where you have very fast figures. You really don't want to open up ornaments too wide. This is going to confuse the listener. Uh, yeah, so the touch here is so important. Because if you were if you were just to like bang this one out, it would just be way too much for the listener's ear. So practicing this one very slow, like I mean insanely slow, and observing all the dynamics, connecting that notes with your arm that need to connect, I think will lead you to success in this one. Yay. So that's what I like to Awesome. Any questions? <clears throat> yeah, thank you so much. Um, you know, I was just uh, really enjoying uh, listening um, to all of these excerpts being played at super, super high levels. Um, so congrats on that. Those uh, to everybody who's watching too, um, these excerpts will be available um, to watch in addition to the recording in the class. Um, we'll make that available after the class ends. Um, and Frankly, there, you know, I don't know of many other places where there's this high quality of playing on display um, for all of the kind of major glockenspiel excerpts, especially exotic birds. Um, so that's really, really cool. Um, and thank you so much, Marcelina, for putting that together. Um, and yeah, also just going back to, to your, to your kind of concepts for the class, singing and ringing, um, just pointing out to everyone, um, the idea of singing uh, is so so cool because I was thinking of it in terms of the sound of the instrument 
but to hear you actually sing the lines of lots of these excerpts i'm like oh no that's what she means and that's brilliant that's we should all be doing that um and and you know to bring out musicality and to and to get rhythms and style and feel correct um that's such a great way of doing it and then ringing as well um i particularly noticed how attentive you are to muting the instrument uh, when you finish an excerpt um, and doing that with your hands and fingers and doing that really carefully and intentionally um, i think we all see a lot of especially young players in particular who kind of just play the instrument and don't and, and don't really think about kind of those finer details um, and so that's a great uh, great nugget for all of you guys out there who are learning these for the first time um, really pay attention to the ends of the notes um, on triangle and glockenspiel these instruments that ring um, really make sure that you're intentional about where you're muting and muffling. So anyway, those are the kind of my reactions to it. And again, thank you so much. We do have a couple awesome questions here. So I'll go ahead and throw it over to that. Uh, we have one attendee who says, whenever I play the glockenspiel, I always get so overly conscious of my volume and power. Uh, whenever I'm about to strike a note, my arm and wrist kind of freeze up. I don't, I don't, don't actually don't hit the bar. <laughs> I've definitely experienced this. Um, so wondering how I can make my movement feel more relaxed and less tense. Oh, such a great question. Yeah, I've definitely, I mean, we've all done this, especially like we go up to play magic flute and we're like, and like, you know, it's, it's so common, especially, you know, if you're using these sticks, it's so common to um, have a lot of these ghosting moments. I mean, it happens to everybody, it happens to professionals. Um, but how do we like limit it as much as we can? Um, and how to, yeah, basically like try to, you know, quell your fear of the glock and spiel. Not, not that you have a fear, but you know what I mean? Like uh, playing these loud sounds confidently, but not harshly. And then also being able to play the soft sounds confidently uh, and presently, but still soft. Um, so yeah, a couple of things. I mean, I kind of talked about learning to approach the instrument very softly. Like I just put my glockenspiel mallets down. I don't know if you can see, but practicing this, not that you, you by no means need to do this before you play like La Mer. I'm not saying I don't, I don't do that, but you can, but just, but being able to feel where that stick head touches the bar being able to feel that and then try to feel it in your forearm and your fingers. I know it's, it's like almost very meditative, but try to feel it in your fingers through your forearm, through your wrist, forearm and your arm. What does that feel like to you? And try to memorize that feeling. And when you maybe have a moment of like, okay, I'm kind of ghosting, happens to everybody. What really helps with that is this sense of forearm and arm. And chances are, if you are kind of um, ghosting things, it's either one of two things. Um, you're, tr you're probably attempting to play it a little bit honestly too soft for the dynamic, or the motion that's happening, this happens, Maybe there's like a quick, quick motion. You just don't get to the note. Like you, you are mis, you misjudged, you misfired. Um, try to like stop when that happens and be like, what happened? Um, try to have a lot of these very conscious practice moments. Be like, oh, I just missed that by, okay. I, I didn't use enough arm or I need to practice this motion. What is that motion? So some, 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 for example, something like waterfall um practicing that motion away from the instrument what does that feel like um so for example if you were to play like a triangle note as well i mean like if you if you're you know stressing out of stressing out about this really soft note before you play it in orchestra maybe you won't maybe you won't accidentally play it so practicing approaching the instrument very slowly and seeing what that feels like in your arm really helps. I remember um, seeing one of my colleagues in school practice. I remember seeing him like at seven in the morning, just practicing a triangle like this. And I think I finally understand the method to his madness. So yeah, 
think about think about this concept of arm weight and the follow through. Really chew on it. Awesome. We've got another question, kind of going along those lines, um, but also um, specifically about mallets. Um, one uh, one attendee who says, "I noticed that glockenspiel players sometimes hold the mallet somewhere in the middle." Um, how do you hold them? Is the position different from where we hold mallets when we're playing marimba or other keyboards? And kind of along those lines, um, if you're practicing arpeggios and, and scales and other things, not excerpts uh, at the instrument, um, do you recommend practicing those with different kinds of mallets, metal, smaller, bigger, heavier, in order to get used to touch and, and get to that level of mastery? Yeah, totally. Obviously, when you're practicing um, something like scales and arpeggios which i totally recommend is yeah maybe you don't want to go for your brass mouths because you're just you're gonna go deaf so and in general when you play this uh instrument try to wear earplugs please try to wear earplugs because it's the you know the high pitches and just the incredible loud um volume it can reach can really be damaging so when you're practicing you know scales the instrument it's more about getting used to this horizontal motion I was talking about um, where do I hold the stick I think I mean it depends some sticks have uh, what's it called like um, the wooden handle and in this case I don't find I need to let's see well they're longer um, I do find that yeah we do hold them in the middle I think primarily because of the weight of the mallet and in order to not play down into it, I think it would be much more difficult to scoop back on the stick and have this sense of light touch. Because already you're kind of dealing, you're, you're starting in a worse spot. So if you start off a little bit closer to the shaft, I, I, like, I mean, it's not what I recommend for basically any other instrument, but we do kind of have to some of these um, sticks have like a grip, so I just hold it near the front of that grip because they already come kind of pre-weighted. They have this grip to it. Some of them don't like these common. There's a bunch of different kinds of these Mozart sticks, but a lot of them are quite uncomfortable to hold. But I feel like they're just kind of their own world. You can also, if you want, you could put your own uh, tubing on it or a weight. I remember, I've, I remember back in school, I like just put a bunch of gaff tapes till it was like a grippy, grippier uh, situation. But yeah, in terms of, in terms of mallet selection, it, it just has to do with, yeah, the music that you're playing. I mean, you have to really be flexible, especially if you, you know, once you get the gig and you're in the orchestra, I mean, you have this idea, like I want to use the softest, most beautiful mallets. And half the time I'm like playing with brass or something really, really hard. I mean, Steven can probably attest to this as well. It's like, generally they just really just need it needs to be heard whereas in audition you can totally go you know soft and just show off all the stuff um yeah hopefully that answers that question yeah definitely um all right so we have another question here that's actually in multiple parts so i'll kind of um um, give them one at a time here, but uh, kind of following up with the mallets, uh, what mallets do you recommend that are like kind of a must need in your bag <clears throat> um, for orchestra playing, for excerpt playing, um, different kinds of metals and plastics and things like that. Um, just quickly, like your, your kind of mallet setup. Yeah. A um, couple ones, I would say like one of the number ones is this clear ball mallet um here i just have this freer ones um these are just really good for all these soft excerpts i mean i use these uh, for so many excerpts in within the audition particularly and then some kind of black pair um these are kind of like my next or my my third step up um right under the brass i would say like it's like 
uh, there's clear ones, there's like brown and like gray, uh, there's gray types, like kind of like this will be the step up from clear. Um, I don't know what material this is, I'm really bad with gear, but um, and then next ones will be black. And uh, these, I would say, are most, most used almost in orchestra because they're just really present, loud, but not overbearing. And then the next thing would be some kind of brass or aluminum. I suggest both. I think those are most important. So clear, I would say if you had to buy brass, aluminum, one of those two, clear and then black. Cool. Yeah, I think that's a pretty pretty good just breakdown of, of those different uh, families of mallets um, that you should have in your bag. Uh, here's an interesting one. Um, should we look at the keyboard while playing or sight reading or not look at the keyboard? Like, are you, do you find yourself looking more at the music or more at the actual keyboard when playing? Hmm. Uh, I mean, I really try to memorize as much as I can and look down at the keyboard uh just because of you know things like accuracy and making sure that i'm following through and you know, just really making sure that i aim at like the center of each bar as much as i can that's a whole nother thing is uh, as much as you can obviously you want to play in the center of the bar there's just some sometimes you just can't and there's nothing wrong with that certain I, certain instruments it's totally fine it's especially this adams and like a lot of these parsifal bells like it's not it's not going to sound terrible if you just hit the you know the edge of it It really won't some of course some will you know but i would say for the most part you can totally get away with it and going back to uh what we were talking about with touch we have a couple of questions here along those lines um wondering if there's a contrast between something like magic flute versus sleeping beauty which you demonstrated at the beginning um, this J stroke for legato playing, um, do you apply that to both of these um, for levels of legato um, or not? Uh, yeah, I think um, between the two, I would say like, yes. Yeah, so Sleeping Beauty definitely uses it a lot. Um, as you saw, I was really connecting the strokes with my arm. And then for the Mozart, it was definitely the same, but just in a smaller, smaller setting for sure. Because I don't have time to do ta 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 pa pa. And like I was saying there, there's kind of two voices going on, but I feel like there's this concept. I mean, I hate to like kidnap the use of the word J stroke. I mean, I don't even know if really that's the proper way of saying it. It just help, helps me kind of describe what I'm doing. But um, I feel like it's in almost everything I do to a certain extent, even some of this brighter playing ta 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 ta, it's, there's still this concept of finishing each stroke is just smaller. I'm not, you know, doing this very big swimmy motion for Sleeping Beauty as I do with, let's say, Sorcerers or something. Awesome. I, I quickly want to jump in. Sorry to interrupt the class again. But I, uh, I want to give a quick shout out to a Mr. Juan who has just uh, donated to the Percussion Conservatory uh, our suggested donation, which is very, very generous, and we're very grateful for that. And to everyone who's watching, if you have uh, gotten value from this class, like Juan obviously has, then please consider making our $20 suggested donation for this class or $50 for the whole Back to School series, because this money is being put directly back into funding more master classes. And we've, we've received a lot of donations so far. It's been a really awesome thing to see so many people rallying around this community already and marcelina thank you so much for putting on this class for us um we are we're just really excited guys everything that we're doing is working we're almost up to a thousand followers already on our facebook page uh the instagram is uh i think approaching 500 soon and so you guys are you're absorbing it you're liking it things are going well and we just want to keep it going we want to do more and more we want to get the classes to as high a level as we can we want to get more people on our team and your donations are the thing that are making that possible for us so we really appreciate it and everyone who's also you know you guys who are watching on the webinar i just sent you the link a little bit earlier it's www.linkpr.ee backslash the pc and if you're on facebook you can find it at the top of our page it's our website link 
um, for the donation there. And if you, if you, for whatever reason you can't find it, you can send us an email or get in touch with us. Just send me a direct message on Facebook or Instagram or hello at the percussionconservatory.com. It's all over the place. So thank you guys again so, so much. And we'll get right back to our scheduled programming. All right. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Yeah, yeah, and thanks so much, Josh, uh, for organizing all of this and um, and keeping us going. I'll recap the series um, for all of you guys too as well. This is our fourth class in the Back to School series here with Marcelina. Uh, we have one more, it's a week from today uh, with Chad Crummel, uh, one of the newest percussionists in the US Navy band is gonna be presenting on snare drum. So definitely tune in a week from today, that's next Thursday on um, Eastern time in the US uh, for Chad's class. Um, and you can already view the previous classes are up on the website, I believe. Um, Ed Choi from the Soul Philharmonic Symbol class, Pedro Fernandez of the Indianapolis Symphonies Tambourine class, and Charlie Rosemary, and Marcelina's colleague at New World Symphony, uh, presented on the vibraphone. So you can definitely go and check all of that out on the website as well. And then Marcelina, for you, I think there's one more question here. Um, and yeah, last chance, last call too here, guys, um, as we kind of wrap up, if you have any questions, drop them in the Q&A um, and we'll get to them in the last couple, five minutes or so here. So uh, the question we have is, uh, do you have any books you'd recommend um, or suggest to get different excerpts or for studying the glockenspiel? Yeah, I mean, there are obviously a bunch of excerpt books out there. I tend to um, get copies of these excerpts directly from the library or like IMSLP. Um, just because when it's reprinted in an excerpt book, there have been errors in them. So, you know, maybe take that, take those absolutely, but just double check it with the actual music. Um, so I get my music that way. And what was the second part of the question? Sorry. Yeah, just um, just uh, yeah, any excerpts, uh, uh, excerpt books. I was going to recommend obviously the Rainer Carroll series mm -hmm. um, has all the Glockenspiel excerpts in it. So if you guys aren't familiar with that, um, all the orchestral instruments are contained in those books. Uh, that's C A R R O L L. Um, the former principal percussionist of the LA Philharmonic uh, has books uh, published that have pretty much all of the percussion repertoire in them. So definitely check that out and that'll give you all of the, uh, the glockenspiel rep. Um, so yeah, any other questions coming in here? Um, not seeing any. But yeah, thanks again um, to all of our viewers on Facebook coming and being here today and donating. We really appreciate it. Um, it's great to see you. And um, yeah, thanks again, Josh, any last thoughts? No, guys, that is it. Marcelina, you are an all-star in every single aspect of that word. You are shining and ringing, and we're just so excited about this series, guys. It's awesome. I am, I mean, it's, uh, it is 1224 a.m. for me. It is just a little past midnight, and I'm like wide awake watching these classes. <laughs> I usually go to bed at like 10, you know? Um, so it's just exciting. It's really, really exciting. And please stay tuned. Got, and if guys, for whatever reason, as I'm, more donations are coming in right now, thank you so much for this. It, it's, it, it's like making my day. It really is. It's making all of our dreams come true legitimately. I know that's cheesy, but it's just this was a dream of ours to put these sorts of classes together and you're making them possible. So thank you. And if for whatever reason, this is not a good time for you to be donating, aka uh, you're a student or coronavirus or any reason, all you need to do to help us out is just share this content. So please share it on Facebook. Tell your friends about it. Like our Instagram page, like our Facebook page. The YouTube stuff is about to start rolling because we'll have all different sorts of uh, automatic translations for YouTube. So if you want to watch with captions in Spanish or Portuguese or any other language, tell your friends that that's coming. Just just spread this like wildfire, guys. Let this uh, let this reach all the corners of the earth because that's what it's for. It's for you guys. It's for our collective community. So thank you guys who have already joined our little percussion conservatory studio. And uh, and yeah, that's all from me. Mar Marcelina, do you have any do you have any closing thoughts that you'd like to leave the audience with today? It's your class, so we'd love to hear from you last. Yeah, I mean, I hope. Uh, thank you so much for having me again. Uh, such a pleasure to do this class for you guys. Um, and I hope that you come away with um, just a lot of uh, ideas to just experiment with. Um, like I, I was saying, like none of what I was saying is like you must approach this 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 way. 
but this is, I just hope it gives you some ideas and some paint to work with. Um, I, I never want to paint the painting for you. I just want to give you some paint. And so have fun. Awesome. And Stephen, you can you can have the, the very, very final word, and then we'll close out. Oh, Theo in the back of that. Little man, little man. Little <laughs> <laughs> I've got to go chase him. But uh, yeah, thanks again, everyone, for coming. Uh, Brava, Marcelina, um, beautiful playing. I really enjoyed that. And all of the information and instruction is, is really top quality. So thanks. I hope you guys have a great season, by the way, down at the New World Symphony. A um, lot of cool things. Check them out, too, guys. Lots of uh, streaming opportunities online. Um, and really, really cool things happening um, down at New World. That's my former home. So it's a very special place to me. Um, so yeah, hope you guys have a great year and hope to see you soon. Thank you again. Thank Cheers. you. Cheers. Bye, everybody.